Model 9 in the Social Policy for Development Planners course brings us back to the essential linkages between social and economic policy in the development process. <clears throat> Building back better from the pandemic for an inclusive, resilient and sustainable future depends on a synergistic relationship between social and economic dimensions of Africa's development. Understood as social investment, social policy expenditure is essential for ensuring inclusive development. For development to be sustainable, it must be underpinned by a robust and equitable social policy investment. Social policy responses can become resilient when underpinned by a robust development process. We explore the rationale for a transformative approach to social policy for countries engaged in the development process. The fundamental question, as Mkandawire notes, is, and I quote, what questions does a country in the development process ask of its social policy, end of quote. This is not the same as describing social policy instruments in use in developing countries. <clears throat> development planning, as we noted in module one, is a deliberate process of securing structural and fundamental socioeconomic transformation in a country or region. Social policy in such context goes beyond the simple case of Keynesian demand side management or imitating the dominant social policy programs deployed in post-development context of advanced industrial con industrialized countries. The development process calls for the same deliberate process of allocating resources to include the intentional deployment of social policy to work in tandem with economic policy, mitigate the adverse and disruptive effects of development process itself, and serve as corrective instrument for delivering inclusive development. Creating an enabling environment for development involves a significant investment in human resources required for powering development. The two-sector model in Arthur Lewis development process requires reallocating labor from the low productivity and cultural sector to the high productivity modern industrial sector. In special terms, this involves the movement of people from rural areas to the urban areas, which immediately raises issues of urban planning, housing, transport, and the provision of education and health services. As Adelman and Morris confirmed decades ago, left to its own devices, and I quote, the primary impact of economic development on income distribution is on the average, to decrease both the absolute and the relative incomes of the poor. Not only is there no automatic trickle down of the benefit of development, on the contrary, but the development process also leads typically to a trickle up in favor of the middle classes and the rich, end of quote. The development process does not by itself produce an equitable distribution of income or inclusive outcome. Each of these three significant investment in human resources needed for development, the spatial allocation of the population, spatial relocation of the population, and the trickle up effects of the early stages of the development process are concerns that an expansive social policy framework will address. Investment in human resources is a core social policy concern. And so is the process provision of housing, transport, healthcare services, 
and ensuring the equitable distribution of the proceeds of development. The development process is immensely disruptive and you need a robust and expansive social policy framework to mitigate such disruptions. An essential aspect of social disruption is the fracturing of social relation, which can take a class, ethnic, or religious form. The critical task of social policy in its nation building or social cohesion task is essential for creating social cohesion necessary for sustainable economic and social development. There's a reverse direction in the synergy between social policy and development process. Social, policy, social funds accumulated through social insurance schemes have historically served as sources of development financing. Social policy intended to be transformative of the economy, society, social institution, and social relations is essential for transformative social policy. To reiterate some of the arguments made in Model 2, we understand social policy as the collective public efforts designed to and intended for creating the conditions for and protecting the social well-being of people within a given territory. This includes the norms, institutions, and mechanism through which we ensure the well-being of people. The social development indicators available will allow us to assess the quality of well-being and the progress made in enhancing human well-being. Social policy itself is concerned with the redistributive effect of economic policy, the protection of people from the vagaries of the market and the changing circumstances of life, the enhancement of the productive potential and capacity of members of society, and the reconciliation of the burden of reproduction without a further social tasks and enhancing social cohesion and nation building. To reiterate the, a different point made in Model 5, if we use the nested Russian doll as an example, social assistance is a subset of social protection. In turn, Social protection is a subset of social policy. Social policy has always been about the social questions that a country or a region seek, needs to address. In this sense, as indicated in module two, social policy reflects the dominant ideational commitment around equality and solidarity in society. Similarly, social policy design reflects the balance of power between the different social forces engaged in shaping the policy landscape. Beyond these broad elements that frame the social policy design, context matters in the shape of the specific social policy architecture. The conventional social policy scholarship and policy design in the OECD context, or more specifically in the, Europe, in, the, in the context of Europe and its diaspora, reflects very specific contexts that shape their social policy designs. Three critical aspects of this context specificity involve first that social policy in the AIDS context includes efforts to address the diswelfares of industrialization. Second, in the post-World War II context, social policy in the context of Europe and its diaspora was underpinned by Keynesian concerns, demand-side management intended to provide macroeconomic and social stabilization in a post-development context. Third, the concerns address the diswelfares of industrialization and macroeconomic stabilization will seem to explain the excessive focus on social security and income maintenance instruments in the dominant social policy instrument that were adopted. This is not to discount effort at creating 
universal access to health care and education. In the context of developing countries and the specific African context, the questions that need to be asked of social policy has to reflect the specificities of social, economic, and political challenges with which we are confronted. Two concerns should frame social policy in the specific African context. The imperative of structural transformation and rooting social policy in the African normative context. The first concern refers to the imperative of socioeconomic transformation. In other words, the development process. As Mkandawere noted, what questions do countries in the process of development ask of their social policy? In this sense, the task that a country allocates to its social policy in the context of its development are important for its social policy architecture. Development requires a skilled and healthy population. These are core social policy concerns of investment in human capital through the provision of access to education and healthcare. Further, structural transformation immediately raises social policy concerns. Take the simple case of the Lucian model that we referred to earlier on, which involves shifting labor from subsistence sector to the modern sector. In addition to the implications for creating a skilled labor force with the demand on education, the shift of the labor force from the rural to urban areas throws up the issues of the provision of housing, urban and regional planning, transportation, water and sanitation, healthcare facilities, education services, and so on. A failure in any of these areas will harm a country's development outlook. Ne the neglect of proper urban planning and housing, or rather the abandonment of the requirement for planning in these areas alone has meant the expl explosive expansion of shanty towns and slums, or what is called informal housing in many countries of the, of the, Afri on the African continent. As Adelma and Morris noted, left to its own devices, the development process will produce a trickle-up rather than a trickle-down effect, assumed in mainstream economics. In other words, the income that accrues to the lower income group reduces in relative and absolute terms. In contrast, the income accruing to the middle and affluent segment of the population increases in relative and absolute terms. The inequalities that this creates is often a source of social tension and discontent, which impairs the development process itself. Social policy instruments for ensuring a more deli deliberately equitable distribution of the benefits of development is a requirement for a sustainable development process. You'll need to unlock your iPhone, Bell. Further, there is nothing inherent in the development process that addresses gender inequality. Addressing gender concerns in the development process is vital for ensuring equitable access to education facilities to ensuring that the, that the burden of care that women bear disproportionately and equitable participation in the productive sector outside the household is ensured. Deliberate social policy instruments are required to redress gender inequality and ensure the transformation of gender relations. Socially sensitive awareness of the solid sanitary needs of adolescent females, for instance, is vital in ensuring equitable access to education. Similarly, a socially sensitive collective approach to care provision is essential in reconciling women's burden 
of reproduction with a variety of other social and economic tasks in which a woman may choose to engage. It allows women to actively engage in, a productive, in productive economic activities and formal employment without creating additional burden for women. Social policy is, is, is central to efforts at transforming gender relations. Development on its own is immensely disruptive. From the loosening of the extended family support for social provisioning to the rapid urbanized, to, to, to rapid urbanization. Building progressively robust social policy architecture is vital for mitigating the disruptive sides of the development process. Equally significant, especially in the African context, is the role of social policy in nation building projects in the context of multi-ethnic, multiracial, and multi-religious you know, uh, countries. The core component of this task of social policy is in the transformation of identities beyond parochial and primordial identities. Highly divisive ethnic and religious based politics, especially in the context of competitive democratic politics, is likely to create the environment for violent contestation of power, which itself undermines the sustainability of the development process. Social policy instruments have been central to the efforts in countries that have strived to transcend parochial and primordial identity in politics. We will discuss this further in this model. Social policy measures are also crucial in the post-conflict peace building and reconstruction efforts. A further answer to the why transformative social policy is the need to transcend the neoliberal diminution of social policy. In earlier models, we have identified this as creating a system of what we call stratified, segmented, and segregated social policy. Underpinning this model of social policy is the liberal vision that, that the market is the first port of call in social provisioning and only in the demonstrable cases of an individual's or households' inability to provide for themselves will the public authorities step in to offer support. In the period since the 1980s, with structural adjustment program, what we call first wave neoliberalism, this has involved the rolling back of the state's public social provisioning and efforts to insert market transactional logic into even the remaining areas of public provisioning, such as introducing user fees in accessing healthcare or education services. Stratified social policy instruments, such as private health insurance with different premium rates and benefit packages, exacerbate rather than reduce social inequalities and weaken social cohesion and social solidarity. In the case of healthcare services, there is a tendency for the overconsumption of healthcare in the top layers of society and maldistribution of healthcare resources, including human resources. To illustrate with the case of South Africa, the country's total health spending is around 8.8% .8 of, of the GDP well above the recommended WHO level. Yet the burden of disease remains high. In the early 2000s, about 16% of the population with private health insurance consumed over 50% of health expenditure, usually through private health care facilities. The remaining more than 80% of the population who depend on healthcare services provided through public 
site <laughs> consume less than 50% of the total health expenditure. About 70% of all doctors and as much as 80% of specialists are in the private health sector. 30% of doctors work in public health sector catering for to over 80% of the population. In 2018, the share of the population that secures their healthcare need through private insurance and the private sector had declined to 15.42%, with beneficiaries standing at 8.91 million individuals out of a population of 57.78 million. Some of those on private insurance, especially those on lower grades medical options, will run out of benefit before the end of a calendar year. In such cases, the individual concern may revert to out-of-pocket expenditure, use of public health facilities, or a combination of the two. As a president of the South African Medical Association once noted, and I quote, I've seen many instances of patients in the public health system dying when hospitals can't keep them longer. If you've got money, you can buy and save lives. In the public sector, for example, kidney, kidney dialysis is rationed, end of quote. The public health sector and over 84% of the population come up second best and under-resourced, not because of a lack of overall national resources, but because of the stratified nature of the healthcare provisioning. Stratification of benefit based on ability to pay or the labor market hierarchies reproduces current income and health and wealth inequalities. Employment-based health insurance involves employer contributions. The average health expenditure illustrates this inequality. In 2018-2019 financial year, the average spending per person in public health sector was 4,480 rand against 17,225 rand in the private sector. Above, <clears throat> we have also spoken about the segmentation of healthcare provision as mostly between public and private sector. But within the private insurance system, there is further segmentation based on medical schemes, options, and healthcare benefits. In 2018, there was on average 6.48 options for each of the medical schemes in the country. The generosity of the healthcare benefits available under each option would depend on the ability to pay the insurance premium, which itself reflects current income and wealth inequalities. A dimension of the segmented healthcare system is the fragmentation of medical schemes. Health insurance providers and health insurance providers. While the number of medical schemes declined from a high of 146 in 20, 2001, in 2018, there were 79 schemes made up of 21 open schemes and 58 restricted schemes. Open schemes are open because they are available to anyone to join while restricted schemes are most often offered by and limited to employees of specific enterprises or employing organization. This segmentation of health systems financing creates fragmented pools of funds. In the class of restricted medical schemes, the government employees medical scheme GEMS account for 45.94% of the total number of beneficiaries. In the class of open medical schemes, 
Discovery Health Medical Scheme account for 58.19%. In other words, outside of these two dominant medical schemes, there is even a higher degree of fragmentation of health funding pools in the health financing system. In 2018, MedShield Medical Scheme, for instance, had 164,774 beneficiaries on its books against 2,792,583 beneficiaries on the Discovery Health Medical Scheme. The administrative overhead for managing the schemes proliferates with the number of schemes. In 2018, 14.9% or 2.357 billion rand went into the administrative expenses of operating the medical schemes. In 2018, medical insurance brokers received 311 million rand in brokerage fees. The inequality in health system financing is compounded by a fiscal welfare regime that provides tax breaks to subscribers to private health insurance schemes. In South Africa, the tax break for medical insurance scheme was to the amount of 64.8 billion in 2012, 15.8 billion in 2013, and 16.8 billion in 2014. The fiscal welfare implications of individual pension scheme is even more significant. In South Africa, the tax deduction for pension contribution was 46.4 billion in 2014 and 182.6 billion in 2017. The average tax deduction for the 3.6 million assessed taxpayers in 2018 was 2.6 times the amount paid in social assistance old age grant. The segregated nature of the healthcare health system means that the burden of caring for over 84% of the population falls on the public health sector with disproportionately lower medical and health resources. The nature of the segmented healthcare delivery system imposes a considerable burden on the public health system and rationing of healthcare uh, services, as earlier indicated by the South African Medical Association president. Yet in comparison, South Africa offers a better resourced and robust health system compared with most other African countries. In many countries, the community health insurance scheme is offered as a segregated healthcare financing system for the low income segment of the population. The nature of the health of the scheme provides basic health benefit at best and often without coverage of such healthcare needs such as dialysis. The fragmentation in stratified, segmented, and segregated health system is an embodiment of the neoliberal retooling of healthcare services in the wake of structural adjustment programs. Not only a liberal social policy for healthcare system financing fragmented, but they are also often far less efficient and inequitable than publicly mandated single payer health care systems. It is for this reason that South Africa is redesigning its healthcare financing towards a single payer system under the National Health Insurance Scheme. Perhaps it is in the context of the pension scheme that the neoliberal social policy undermines the synergy between social policy and development financing. As we will discuss further later in this model, the National Social Insurance Pension Scheme has the potential to accumulate social funds that have been used in financing healthcare projects. In the wake of the repurposing of pension system in, in Chile, individual account privately managed pension funds have been 
purpose to support capital markets to fund private enterprises. Not only has the state in such contests withdrawn from the purposive development planning and strategic coordination, but there are also no strategic development projects available for financing through which such social funds as national health social insurance pension scheme may offer. South Africa's Public Investment Corporation, which serves as public fund managers, has about 2.13 trillion in assets, rent, three trillion rent in assets. It has been preoccupied in playing the stock markets mainly for investing in the Johannesburg Security Exchange. Transformative social policy invites us to return to a wider vision of social policy. Wider understanding of the instruments of social policy. A higher acceptable level of human well being and human worth. And getting social and economic policy to work in tandem. Transformative social policy involves fundamental structural changes in the economy, social relations, and the social institutions of a country with the objective of an expanded and deeper idea of human well being. A central aspect of the transformation of social relations is the transformation of gender relations and eliminating structural impediments that underscore gender inequality inequities and hinder the achievement of equitable gender relations. Transformative social policy is concerned with addressing the structural underpinnings of diswelfares, vulnerability, and entitlement failures. Rather than a focus on ex post mitigation of or coping with vulnerability, Transformative social policy is seized with a focus on ex ante addressing of vulnerability or prophylactic social policy intended to prevent entitlement failure of vulnerability. In this sense, the collective public effort at securing well being is not merely about insecurity of those who are extremely poor or in chronic vulnerability but everyone in society. Its remit is not the microeconomic benefit of public support for those in extreme poverty, but in the well-being of the entire population. Its concern is in universal access to benefits and services that embrace the middle classes and other well-off segments of the population. In the words of the African anti-colonial movement, its objective is securing a better life for all. <clears throat> the immediate antecedent of the idea of transformative social policy is the Global Research Project on Social Policy in a Development Context undertaken by the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development in the early 2000s. The project was designed and inspired by Tandikam Kandawiri, the ONRIS director at the time. Additional design and coordinated the sub-Saharan African segment of the global project. At the core of the research project is the question, what questions do you ask of your social policy and how do you task it in the context of development? In other words, when you are in the pursuit of structural transformation of economy and society. The framework of transformative social policy was articulated in the 2006 research and policy bulletin setting out the lessons from the research project. This has since been elaborated in other works by Nkandawiri and Adeshino. Tadi Ake Aino set out the immediate antecedent of the synergistic relationship between social policy and economic policy 
In a recent project he led at the Dakar-based Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, Codesphere. Mkandawire was the executive secretary of Codesphere at the time the research was initiated. In policy terms, the deliberate connection of the nexus of social and economic policy has a long antecedent. From the work of Alva and Gunnar Melda to Julius Yerere and the development policies in Africa and East Asia. This range from an insistence that social expenditure should be understood as an investment rather than a spending drain on the fiscals to tapping a wide range of social policy instruments in driving the development objectives to improving human well-being. The premise of transformative social policy includes the following. The return to a wider vision of social policy involving a wider and inclusive vision of what a good society means, as well as a higher threshold of human worth. This calls for the use of broader instruments in striving for human well-being, ranging from education to active labor market policies of continuous skill of reskilling of workers uh, to include land and agrarian reform policies, social insurance, affirmative action, etc. B, the interconnectedness of social and economic objectives. C, the awareness of the specific characteristics and deployment of social policy in the context of development. D, an understanding of the multiple levels and domains of transformation in the context of development. This ranges from economic development, in other words, structural, adjust, structural transformation of the economic mastery of technology and the dynamic manufacturing capacity to the transformation of social institutions and social relations, especially gender relations, to the building of a democratic deliberative system of governance. And finally, an awareness, <coughs> an awareness of the multiple task of and the imperative of multitasking social policy. As Ima Adelman notes, economic development as distinct from mere economic growth combines self-sustaining growth, structural change in patterns of production, technological upgrading, social and political institution modernization, and widespread improvement in human conditions." End of quote. Modernization is understood in this context as continuous improvement in how we do things rather than efforts to be like the West. In the prevailing context in which the idea of development has been hollowed out of the original intention of structural transformation of economy and society, mastery of technology and dynamic manufacturing capacity, Nkandawure made a distinction between the Harry Truman and the Bandung Conference versions of the post-World War II development discourse. In the Truman, in the Truman take on development in which I quote, international development is, is merged. Development is the moral premise for helping distant strangers, end of quote, with its attendant paternalism. In the spirit of the 1955 Bandung Conference, development involves growth with structural transformation of economy and society the mastery of technology and strong manufacturing capacity. Development requires learning from the pioneers, but it is not mimicry. 
the knowledge imperative requires considerable investment in institutions of knowledge production and state capacity. The capacity to coordinate and steer the development process. This involves a sustained ecosystem of innovation and capacity to respond to a broad range of challenges. Structural transformation and the mastery of technology go with innovative and robust manufacturing capacity. In the Bandung spirit, development is in the words of Samir Amin, also grounded in a national sovereign project. In the African context, it is a quest for averting the extraversion of its economies, cultures, and knowledge systems. Transformative social policy highlights the five tasks of social policy. These are the production task, the protection task, the reproduction task, the redistribution task, and the nation building or social cohesion task of social policy. The production task of social policy involves the use of those social policy instruments that are concerned with raising and improving the productive capacity of a people within a given context. We can think of education as a mechanism for building the human resources and skill capacity of the population. Development requires skilled personnel, and education is a social policy instrument, as a social policy instrument is geared towards, in, towards creating such a capable labor force. Similarly, active labor market policies, efforts to improve the skill level and retain, retrain people in the labor force is another example of social policy measures that can be tasked with enhancing the productive capacity of the population. The protection task of social policy involves the policy instruments that are intended to protect, manage, and prevent risk and vulnerability. They are instruments that generally fall under the remit of social protection. Transformative social policy will be concerned as much with the design of social policy measures that are prophylactic as with instruments intended to respond to vulnerability, especially of the external shock variety. Production support measures, including farm subsidy, is an instrument that is not, not often immediately recognized as a social policy measure, but one that has the effect of raising income and protecting ex ante against vulnerability. Marketing boards have been used in the past to smoothen income and consumption among the farming population. Social policy instruments that are intended to ensure redistribution outcomes often involve efforts to even out life chances within the population and ensure a more equitable distribution of the proceeds of development. A progressive tax system or income on income and profit that provide the financing for universal healthcare service and education is an example of social policy instrument designed to tap the redistributive task of social policy. The reproduction task of social policy has been the most significantly, most significantly highlighted by feminist economists who have argued, for instance, that labor power is a produced resource or a produced commodity, but one whose production is shrouded within the context of unpaid care work within the household. Much of the work that goes into the social reproduction of the population is done within the domestic arena and falls dis disproportionately on women. Care for children and elderly, household chores, and production for use values, cooking meals, washing clothes, ironing clothes, cleaning in the house, and so on and so forth, tend to fall disproportionately on women. 
there are social policy frameworks erected on male breadwinner family models. In such contexts, women who bear the burden of care economy subsidize the employers of the male spouses with unremunerated domestic labor. More importantly, if the burden of what is essentially a socially significant function, in other words, the reproduction of the population, is allowed to fly where they fall, this creates all manner of obstacles to women's active engagement in the economy, especially in formal employment. Social policy can bear the task of ensuring that the burden of care is socialized, in other words, is borne by society through the provision of childcare facilities outside the home, social care for the elderly, and a fundamental shift in gender norms that ascribes household chores and nurture to women. A recognition of the nurturing role of men leads to paid maternity leaves for men to look after their children, similar to paid maternity leaves. Publicly provided crutch and early childhood education facilities are social policy services intended to socialize care and give women the space to engage in formal economic activities. Deliberate social policy instruments that have been used to build social cohesion or underpin the nation building project in the context of factious multi ethnic, multi racial, and multi or multi religious context. Services are offered within a shared context and on an equal basis to members of diverse ethnic, racial, and religious groups. The objective is to create shared affinity and identity based beyond the primordial identities. The attenuation of social tension or even violence that emerges in the wake of social cohesion tasking or social policy is vital for well being and a sustainable development process. The diversity of Social policy instrument ranges from education to healthcare facilities and healthcare services to social housing, agrarian reform, to labor market policy, affirmative action, family and child policy, social care provision, old age support, social insurance to fiscal policy. Each of these instruments can tap multiple tasks of social policy. The public provision of quality education from primary, pre-primary to tertiary level could simultaneously tap the production, protection and social cohesion tasks of social policy. Production in that it enhances the human resources and the skilled capacity of its beneficiaries, thereby enhancing their productive capacity. But what can also see it as being a prophylactic instrument for protection against risk and vulnerability. On the assumption of a well-functioning and growing economy, children who are beneficiaries of good quality education and competencies are likely to have a better to have better life chances than the generation of their parents. They are likely to be better income earners, contribute to social insurance schemes, and higher income taxpayers, and less likely to be at risk of being chronically vulnerable. Better educated women, for instance, are more likely to have healthy children because of their better competencies in assessing, you know, um, accessing and utilizing available health information and resources. Properly designed, as we will discuss shortly, the public education system can be designed to promote inter-ethnic social cohesion and promote 
a supra-ethnic national identity. In this way, education services can be offered in a manner that contributes to the national and to the nation building project. Similarly, agrarian support instruments can simultaneously tap the production task of social policy while promoting the protection task of social policy, while promoting the protection task of social policy through income and consumption smoothing. In the combined and creative deployment of social policy, it positively enhances diverse development outcomes, economic development, social development, and political development. When underpinned by the norms of equality and solidarity, the preferences within the social policy architecture will be towards universal provisioning within a unified rather than segmented and segregated system of provisioning of services and benefits. Available evidence support the claim that social policy underpinned by the norms of equality and social solidarity creates a positive loop back effect. The originating norms of equality and solidarity tend to reinforce and enhance the norm normative underpinning of the system where fragmented and segregated social policy creates a zero-sum game between the poor and the rich and leaves the poor at the mercy and generosity of the rich. A unified social policy system creates a sense of shared national assets in the institution that provide the common and shared services. The legitimacy of the social policy instrument makes equity-based and solidarity reinforcing reform easier to undertake when the system is under stress. In other words, under the stress such as financing. Within the transformative social policy framework, the mechanism for enhancing human well-being and the instrument for their delivery are best understood as socioeconomic commons rather than public goods. I quote, social policy instruments are not about public goods, at least not in the Samuelson sense of the collective consumption of goods. Each individual's consumption of such goods leads to no subtraction from any other individual's consumption of that good. Rather, they are social, social and economic commons because they involve the idea of a collective common good, not goods. Equity rather than the non-excludability or non-rivality is the determinate condition for access and access may be structured on the base of the gravity of need rather than presentation of demand." End of quote. In this sense, it is essential in building a social policy framework to pay attention to the interconnectedness of the diverse social policy instrument. In other words, it is not about any one but any particular social policy instrument but the coherence and the synergistic relationship between the different instruments. It is about the social policy architecture. Similarly, it is essential to pay attention to the coherence in the normative underpinning of the social and economic policies. It is difficult to have an economic policy framework premised on the norms of possessive individualism and then seek to build a social policy infused with the norms of solidarity on top of that. The coherence of the norms and instruments is essential for a stable social policy architecture. Design, designing such a system is not like shopping in a supermarket where one can choose and mix instruments of different normative tones 
and seek to build a coherent social policy architecture. We can think of the transformative social policy instrument as both a way of conceptualizing social policy as well as a device for evaluating specific social policy regimes. As a device for seeking, making sense of social policy, it calls attention to the multiple tasks of social policy and the diversity of instruments available to policymakers and society in constructing a social policy architecture. It calls attention to the ideational underpinning of social policy, giving preference to the norms of equality and social solidarity. It focuses on social policy as a means for achieving structural transformation, the transformation of the economy, social institution, and social relations. Rather than merely about maintaining a system of resource allocation. Finally, it calls attention to the normative and institutional coherence of a social policy architecture and the in interlocking set of policy instruments that make up the system. As an evaluative device, it sets out the criteria for assessing any social policy instrument or system of provision of services and benefit with particular attention to the normative underpinning of the social policy framework. Transformative social policy offers a mechanism for assessing the individual instrument as part of a whole and the coherence of the social policy architecture. Finally, transformative social policy provides a framework for evaluating social policy outcomes by assessing the extent to which an instrument or architecture addresses the structural underpinnings of this welfare or inequality. In this section of the model, we will illustrate the design of, of transformative social policy with four examples involving the design of public education to serve the purpose of building social cohesion, the use of pension funds to finance development projects, the design of a healthcare system that meets the normative criteria of transformative social policy, and the deployment of social policy for transformation of gender relations. Within the social policy, the provision of educational services is often associated with an investment in building a country's human resources and enhancing the productive capacity of the people. However, we have two cases out of Africa to illustrate the tapping of education to build social cohesion. In other words, to address the nation building objective of a country. These are the cases of Tanzania and Nigeria. In the 1960s and 1970s, Tanzania under Mwalimu Julius Nyerere purposefully crafted the public education system, especially the secondary education system to deepen a Tanzanian national identity among its beneficiaries. The system involved moving of secondary school age children from their home regions to other regions of the country for their education. During the period, they will interact with local communities, with schoolmates from different regions of the country as well. The effect one would suggest was that by the end of their secondary education, the scholars will have developed a sense of shared identity with their classmates and transcend their own local identities in their engagement and interaction with people of the local communities around of the of the local communities around the schools. The effect is to obviate a situation where ethnic identity defines national politics and engagement. If, as Mahmoud Mamdani notes, once noted, Tanzania under Yerere was arguably Africa's most successful nation building project. It would not be only in the use of education in building trans ethnic identity and nation national cohesion. It will be because the purposing of education for 
nation building was one of several other projects for advancing social cohesion. Similarly, in Nigeria at the end of the 1963-67-1971 civil war in the country, the federal government established special purpose secondary schools, the federal government colleges. In the post-war assessment of the factors that led to the civil war, one of these conclusions was that there was insufficient cross-regional and cross-ethnic interaction among Nigerians. In addition to the National Youth Service that started in 1973, a system where fresh graduates of higher education system in the country were required to serve in other parts of the country other than their states of origin for one year, the federal secondary schools were, were established. Colloquially known as unity schools, the schools were established in different parts of the country. The admission policy for the schools requires that student body must be drawn from diverse regions and ethnicities of the country. The, the schools operated a boarding system. The schools and the admission program intended that after spending between five and seven years together in a boarding school environment, the students will have developed a network of friends beyond their ethnic background and nurture a pan-Nigerian identity. It is unclear how successful the project is given the persistent salient of regional and ethnic identities in Nigeria's politics. However, a beneficiary of this of the scheme once noted to me, and I quote, if there's a problem in Nigeria, I know who to call. End of quote. When I asked him why and how his is why and how his response was, I quote, we went to school together. End of school. End of quote. If the nation building project seems less successful in Nigeria in comparison with Tanzania, we're again dealing with the presence or absence of relative coherence in diverse policy instruments intended to create national cohesion. Earlier, we highlighted that the interaction between social policy and development runs both ways. An example we indicated is the use of pension funds to finance development. Pension funds accumulated accumulate capital that can then be tapped to finance different development projects. However, this depends on the design of the pension system. There are, among others, the individual capitalization account pension system, often of the defined contribution variant. Occupational social insurance schemes, which could be of the defined benefit variant, and it will be a national contribution, and it could be a national contributory pension or provident fund scheme or of the defined benefit variant. The significant difference is that the national contributory pension scheme is national and contributions are made to the scheme regardless of where an individual works. Oli Kanga's notes in the case of Finland that, and I quote, in the 1950s, the national pension funds were used to build up the basic national infrastructure, power stations and electric network, for example, whereas the employment-related pension funds, which began to be accumulated at the beginning of the 1960s, were invested mainly in national industry and provided investment capital for industrialization of society. The Finnish case provides an excellent example of how it was possible to unify social policy goals with economic goals of building up modern industrial market economies, end of quote. The first pension fund was established in 1937, fully funded and accumulated in individual accounts in Finland. This was tapped in the 1950s for building national electrification infrastructure. The second pension 
was the employment related scheme established in 1961 and tapped for the industrialization efforts of the country. A third scheme, partially funded municipal pension scheme, was introduced in 1966. This fund was tapped for building houses, a social housing project in the country. The effect was the transformation of a previously agrarian rural country into an industrialized urban country. In the case of South Korea, pension fund was important as a source of development finance. The public authorities in South Korea introduced the National Contributive Pension Scheme in the 1960s with the specific intention of raising capital for financing industrial development. The first public pension scheme to be established was the Civil Service Pension in 1960, followed by the Military Pension Scheme in 1963. Public pension funds were required to lend 90% of their funds to the National Investment Fund, which in turn lends to development banks at significantly discounted rates. Development banks will then lend to designated industries and for infrastructure development. A, a most prominent example of providing development finance to industry was in the development of the heavy and chemical industries. Singapore's Central Pension Fund was established in 1955. It is a compulsory comprehensive savings and pensions plan for Singaporeans and permanent residents in employment. Since then, the Central Pension Fund has grown into a more elaborate scheme beyond ensuring income security in old age to offer healthcare insurance and housing. A statutory board manages the Central Pension Fund under the Ministry of Manpower. Unlike Finland's Community Pension Fund scheme, you know, funds tapped for constructing social housing, Singapore's Central Pension Fund can be used by individuals to purchase homes. And I quote, the Central Pension Funds Board may on the application of the member and subject to such terms and conditions as the board may impose, authorize the whole or part of the amount standing in his credit in the fund to be withdrawn from the fund and paid to the Housing and Development Board. The approved developer, the Jurong Town Corporation, or such other pension persons as may be determined by the board as a deposit for the purchase or acquisition of the house or flat or for the payment of the purchase price or part thereof of the house or flat, end of quote. Over three quarters of all homes in Singapore are built by the Housing and Development Board a statutory body that was established in 1960. In 1968, the authorities introduced the scheme allowing the Central Pension Fund savings to be used for home purchase or mortgage payment. An important aspect of a central national contributory pension system is that its contributions to labor market, it, 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 it's, it's contribution to labor market efficiency. Regardless of where one works, contributions to the person, to the pension or provident fund scheme remains the same. This is different in situations where pensions or provident funds are organized at individual employment level. This is even more complicated in countries where Retirement schemes involve a mixture of pension funds and provident funds and are fragmented. In such a situation, a key consideration in changing employment involves concerns over the effect of changing job on the fund already accumulated in the pension scheme in the individual's current employment. 
in some cases, this will require withdrawing from the current pension funds, transferring the accumulated pension contribution to a preservation account, and then starting a new accumulation of pension funds in the new employer's approved pension fund. This could be an important consideration in deciding to change jobs. In addition to accumulated funds in central national pension schemes being available for development financing, such a design of a pension system also enhances labor market efficiency. Unified as against fragmented pension funds also have the advantage of reducing the cost of administrative overhead. The overriding objective in healthcare systems designed for transformative social policy include closing health inequality gaps, securing quality health outcomes for people within the territory, and ensuring access to healthcare that does not depend on the size of one's pocket. It is in the field of healthcare provision most significantly that the principle of social policy as socioeconomic commons becomes salient. Equity will need to be the determining condition for access, with access structured on the basis of the gravity of need rather than the presentation of demand. The idea of universal access to healthcare is now widely accepted in international policy circles. But the universality of access means different things to different people and institutions. Universal healthcare access has been used in the context of stratified and segregated healthcare financing and access. The idea being that as long as you give everyone some access to basic healthcare needs, you have met the normative requirement of granting access. In such instances, as it's, as it's widely known, low-income people tend to get the short end of the stick, herded into under-resourced and overburdened public health care facilities, where at the best of times, critical care equipment is rationed. Further, when health care becomes service for profit, Access is segregated, and those with the ability to pay, who generally have a lower disease burden, overconsume. And as we saw in the case of South Africa, the healthcare human resources are also highly skewed in their allocation between private and public healthcare sectors. Often, healthcare providers become price takers. Catastrophic healthcare spending may, in fact, not occur because those with little or no resources to pay for expensive medical procedures simply do not present themselves for care. They die quietly at home. Whatever the healthcare system design, there is a need to guarantee healthcare to all regardless of the ability to pay. For single payer or single purchase healthcare system, it is essential to rope in the middle class and the well-off in society. Often, this will require imposing restriction on the provision of health, private health insurance to avoid the stratification of healthcare services. Private insurance coverage may be offered for more cosmetic procedures. In the context of a transformative social policy, the preference is for a unified single payer system offering universal provision and funded in the main through progressive income tax. This may be supplemented by social insurance, payroll tax, earmark tax, or to a lower degree through consumption tax. tax. Unified health systems are broadly understood to be more cost effective with better healthcare outcomes among their development peers. A unified system allows for centralized negotiation for purchasing 
of equipment and medicine and controls the tendency for price dodging by manufacturers, vendors, and pharmaceutical companies. As with other components of the social policy architecture, significant attention and investments will be required for human resource development and a national system of, of innovation. As with other, er, uh, other areas, from teachers to engineers, substantial and ongoing investment in producing highly skilled healthcare workers is essential. Equally important is the requirement for significant investment in high level medical research and development capacity. A robust health, public health system is at the heart of such public, of such healthcare design with highly competent health surveillance and intervention to park capability, an interlocking system of primary healthcare, secondary and tertiary healthcare provision. A robust healthcare system based on primary healthcare involving interdisciplinary community-based healthcare centers produces robust healthcare at the community level with the bonus of reducing the burden on secondary and tertiary healthcare facilities. A core task of transformative social policy in addressing the structural underpinnings of inequality is reconciling the burden of reproduction with other social tasks. In both its narrow and broad senses, women bear disproportionately the burden of social reproduction. The imperative of social justice requires of society and its social policy architecture to address and transcend the gender inequalities that shape our world. Further, there are adverse consequences for failing to socialize care, among other measures needed in reconciling the burden of reproduction with other tasks. Locking out more than half of the population from active participation in the economy and society is a significant loss in utilization capacity and competencies. It is not enough that women enter the labor market. The effect of this without active effort at redressing the court inequity in gender relations and the burden of care has had the impact of declining population rates and premature population aging. Essential social policy instrument in reconciling the burden of reproduction that women bear with other social tasks that women have to bear in society requires a robust provision of an access to maternal and childcare, a generous family support system taken as a collective responsibility of society, generous maternity leave with loss of employment benefit or seniority, and public provision of quality early childcare facilities. It is also essential to promote men's active in, in involvement in household care duties. Equitable access to education sensitive to the needs of the girl child and healthcare are essential for preparing a new generation of females and males for active engagement in the economy, society, and political life of the, of, of, of the country. It is also the task of, of the social policy regime in society to promote equitable access to labor market for men and women with pay equal pay. Support for women's reproductive roles need to be an integral part of the employment framework. In the broad and diverse areas of social, economic, and political life, the promotion of gender-sensitive affirmative action is an essential aspect of a social policy intended to effect transform gender relations. This will involve addressing harmful cultural practices that promote patriarchal norms and engender the suppression of women's voices and active engagement in economy and society. This requires the active promotion of gender equality in public representation. Specific gender norms inherently underpin social policy. 
a transformative social policy approach seeks to advance equity in gender relations. There are three primary preconditions for promoting transformative social policy. In the specific African and the Global South context, this involves clear and definable national sovereign projects. Policy sovereignty and an awareness of the intersectoral linkages between economic and social policy and among the social policy instruments themselves. A national sovereign project sets the parameters for lower order efforts undertaken within the country to address the development challenges. Build a transformed and inclusive society. Ensure an equitable share of the benefits of development. Transcend parochial and primordial identity as the framing mechanism for social political interaction and build a gender equitable society. Policy sovereignty requires the policy that policy is made fundamentally from the standpoint of a country and its national interests and calls for robust capacity and competencies for policy making and policy implementation. Similar to the engineering of the development process, transformative social policy requires policymakers and advocates and advocates awareness of the linkages between diverse social policy instruments. Coherence within the social policy architecture also requires coherence especially in the normative underpinning between social and economic policies. This course is about the place of social policy in driving the development process. We understand development as a continuous process of achieving self-sustaining growth, structural transformation in the patterns of production defined by dynamic manufacturing capacity, mastery of technology and technology upgrading, social, political, and institutional modernization, and the transformation of social relations, especially gender relations, with improved quality of human well-being. The objective of the process is to ensure widespread improvement in human conditions. We have set out in this model how the transformative approach to social policy can drive and promote the development process. We have indicated that the social policy architecture that should underpin the development process. Against the prevailing segregated system of social policy, we have argued for a unified system of provision of services and benefits of a benefit and universal access framed by the norms of equality and social solidarity. This is vital for an inclusive post-pandemic recovery. Investment in education sector should extend to building a robust national system of innovation. Investment in the national health system requires a robust health surveillance capacity and ability to respond to healthcare needs of citizens and residents in a given context. A robust and innovative healthcare system is also important in a country's capacity to respond to outbreaks of infection and diseases. The lessons from Africa's experience with COVID-19 pandemic reiterate a critical point, namely that the development matters and transformative social policy matters. A glaring gap in Africa's response to the pandemic is evident. Weak manufacturing capacity, deficiencies in the national system of innovation, and the inadequate capacity for the prevailing systems of stratified, segmented, and segregated social policy to cope with supporting livelihood. Early in the pandemic, Africa, the African Union established the Africa Medical Supplies Platform to coordinate the acquisition of medical supplies. The facility helps member states to acquire medical resources at a bulk price. 
the PCR test kits being offered on the platforms are imports from India, the US, vendors in Lyon, France, and so on. The glaring absence of autonomous, autonomous manufacturing capacity and, de and, de and dependence on external imports is evident. Where local scientists in Senegal and Nigeria have developed rapid results in new COVID-19 test kits, the validation of the kits depends on, out, you know, on outside forces or forces outside to the outside the continent. In the case of the scientists in the Institute Pasteur de Dakar, who partnered with the UK company Mologic, Mo, Mo their invention was hijacked by their international partners. If the post-pandemic recovery needs to acknowledge the deficiencies in manufacturing capacity, national system of innovation, and the associated ecosystem necessary for resilient recovery beyond the pandemic. In the post-pandemic era, a robust national system of innovation and its linkages with industrial production capacity would be important for programs for enhancing human well-being in sustainable ways. Perhaps nothing signifies the price of investment in the national system of innovation as much as the vaccine story. At the end of 2021, there was no vaccine development program on the African continent, and Africa has had to rely on donation of vaccines from outside forces. Investment in, the, in innovation and coherent industrial policy must be part of a post-pandemic recovery program that is sustainable and resilient. The pandemic highlights the crisis of mal maldevelopment and what Mkandawire referred to as the maladjustment of Africa. The maladjustment is not merely of its economies, but its society, its labor market, and its systems of innovation. As development planners, it will be vital for you to pay attention to a holistic development agenda that connects the social and economic imperatives. Social protection component of the social policy architecture necessary for the post-pandemic recovery needs to promote the values of, the, of an acceptable level of human worth where adequacy for decent living underpins the transfers in cash. The above reinforces the need for a national social policy architecture that is encompassing in its coverage of its residents, a shift towards unified rather than segmented social policy architecture, the normative commitment to, a univer to universal access based on the norms of equality and solidarity, and support based on a higher vision of human worth. The need for increasing formalization of the economy further connects to the imperative of structural transformation of the economy to social policy design. Economic formalization allows for better institutional design and capacity for social insurance elements of the system of social protection. An increased formalization of the economy also allows for greater tax effort and increases domestic resource mobilization to support public policy. This is particularly important for tax-funded social policy instruments. The post-pandemic recovery needs to pay attention to the reproductive, social reproduction task of social policy. Anchored on this is the need to, add, to redress gender inequalities that continue to be the norm in many of our countries. Wider for me, opportunities for women should not simply be about increased quantitative representation of women in the educational system, formal economy, and decision-making structures of our, con of our countries. It needs to pay attention to the double burden that women bear in such circumstances if we do not transform the gender norms that underpin the care e economy and household social reproduction roles. A post-pandemic recovery will need to attend to the socialization of care 
and the provision of air facilities available to all and of sufficient quality that will attract and retain the middle classes. I thank you.